Okay, hello. So my name is Randall Zonier. This is my final project for the medieval church. Um, first, to give a little overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, we'll be going over the five uh, major turning points in the history of the church during the Middle Ages. First, we're going to be tackling the time of Constantine the Great and Norbert of Christianity, the fall of Rome, the time of Pope Gregory I, the Great Schism, and then the Western Schism. All right, starting off, uh, Constantine the Great converted Christianity, increased power of the bishops. Talk about that uh, next in the next slide. And he also started the Byzantine Empire, where the ancient Greek colony of Byzantine was in 330 AD. Uh, but we'll be coming back to this Roman Empire in the East later in the presentation. Sorry, in the West. Um, no of Christianity. Um, so in the late first and early second centuries of the common era, there was less a single Christianity than several Christianities um, until this idea of normative, normative Christianity came along. <clears throat> so uh, normative Christianity was the agreement of the bishops of different communities on doctrines, sacred texts, and ritual practices. Um, so as bishops uh, assembled councils to dictate what Christian scriptures were legitimate and they where they uh, made these councils to produce rules on widespread common matters within Christianity. As power of the churches grew, the council decisions became matters of the state. The councils could then dictate the set of beliefs did or did not agree with the universal consensus. In other words, the councils had the power to dictate what heresy was or was not. Um, their writings of normative Christianity was in a codex. It was cheap to make, and so you could easily spread these ideas. But um, this uh, this idea of no of Christianity of finally one Christianity uh, came about from this agreement of bishops. Um, so now Constantine the first converts to Christianity in a uh, three twelve AD my camera. So um, as Roman Emperor Constantine the Great officially made Christianity a legal religion and personally converted to Christianity, the Christian faith was showered with privileges and wealth. Um, constantly completely altered the relationship between the church and the imperial government, there, thereby beginning a process that eventually made Christianity the official religion of the empire. By the fourth century, Christianity had been transformed, transformed from a persecuted sect to the dominant faith of the empire, in this process becoming intertwined with imperial government. So here is Constantine the Great, the time of Constantine the Great on our timeline, 100 to 400 AD. Next, the fall of Rome in the fourth and fifth centuries. So the church and Rome were intertwined. Um, the church is in a new environment after the fall of Rome and uh, this idea of monastic life is really taking hold and becoming popular in this time. So church, the church in Rome, <clears throat> uh, Rome fell for a variety of reasons. Uh, most important were the tax by Germanic tribes, Rome officially being taken in 410 by the Visigoths led by Alaric. However, the Roman Empire in the West, the Constantine the Great Serb survived. We'll talk about that in, later in the presentation. As I said previously, Constantine led to Christianity being the dominant faith of the empire. As well as this, bishops began to be entrusted with ambassadorial roles. And by 400, church officials had presidents at court for all civil officials. To further this point of church and state being intertwined, the rhetoric Roman writers uh, used is they used to use Rome and the church intertwined, which means it meant the same thing. So uh, this idea is it wasn't the church in Rome, it was the 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 Roman church. There were there were one. Like people thought people when people thought of Rome, they thought of the church. Like that's what they thought. Um next, uh this new environment of the church. Um the fall of Rome saw Germanic tribes taking what was left of the once great Roman Empire. However, the church adapted. Uh, bishops were used as intermediators between Germanic leaders and Roman civilians and were hired in secular activities within the new government set up by these tribes. Um, one reason for this is bishops were educated, trained, and experienced administrators. So basically, these Germanic tribes came in, set up new forms of government and society, and they needed someone who could uh, read and was trained in running a government to basically run the government. And the clergy were the only educated people in the community. 
So bishops were the perfect match for this, this new role. Um, as well as this, generosity of the poor and concern of strangers was expected of any 5th century bishop. Uh, Sinis Apollinaris, a 5th century poet, describes the role of a bishop as a champion to the lesser people. Um, he is to care for the sick, strangers, and prisoners, to see that the dead are decently buried, and to preach to the people. Bishops are now political champions of the community over which they preside. So they're really like taking hold, like bishops are now becoming um, like this, this, the current idea of a bishop where they, they, care, for the, they care for the sick and they, they preach and they, you know, do good deeds. Uh, next, um, one of the reactions of the church to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire was an increased impulse towards mercantilism. Um, as some people opted out of society, mercantilism replaced the old mar martyr system. So under the old martyr system, uh, only martyrs, those who died for the faith, were seen as saints. Um, however, since constantly ended the persecution of Christians, no one was being killed for their faith anymore. So instead, people people died socially for their faith. So they would figuratively die, um, i.e. giving up their worldly possessions to study and pray. Um, these people were now known as monks. One of the most influential one of these monks was St. Augustine. Um, originally for, written for a small group of monks, St. Augustine wrote a set of rules. Um, and then these rules became the foundation for what we know as monistic life or life in a monastery. Um, and on our timeline, oh, sorry, 410 to 530 AD. Moving up from 100 to 530. Moving on to Pope Gregory the First in the late 5th and 6th centuries. Um, this is the first occurrence of papal power, and Pope Gregory the First also tried to rebuild the Roman Empire. So um, before the time of Gregory the First, the Bishop of Rome did not have any power over other bishops, never mind the amount of secular power as the Pope does now. Um, and to specify, the Bishop of Rome is the is currently the Pope. That's his job. Like the Bishop of Rome is the Pope. Um, and before this, the the Pope or Bishop of Rome didn't have any power over any other bishops. But um, after Gregory uh, the first became the Bishop of Rome, he he made he made the Bishop of Rome over all other bishops. And Gregory does this by sending out missionary, missionaries, setting up a militia, passing legal reform, intervening in affairs of rival churches, and using the abundance of relics situated around Rome, all to increase the, the papal power of the Bishop of Rome. Um, and then relics were items said to hold the power of the saints. These were things such as body parts of saints, clothing clothings of saints, or any item they may, that can be attributed to a specific saint. Um, since these these relics were said to have the power of the saints. They uh, they can be used for political political gain um, in various different ways. Next, uh, rebuilding the Roman Empire. Uh, so Pope Gregory I also created an effective administration around the city of Rome. Um, he guaranteed basic necessities to citizens in the city, uh, such as food, water, and peace. Um, he also creates districts called the Papal States, so the Pope is now going to be in charge of areas of land, um, and he's no longer just a spiritual ruler, but now a secular ruler as well. And then we'll add Pope Gregory the first to our timeline. And then um, next, the Great Schism in the 9th to 10th century, jumping to the 9th and 10th centuries. Um, <clears throat> Pope Leo the Ninth and the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, and Michael Solaris. Basically, these were the two heads of the Western Roman Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and they they come together and um, they basically create the Great Schism. Um, so there are various different uh, differences between the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Church, and by the Byzantine Empire, I mean the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, this is the... Um, the, the Western church or the Eastern church that uh, that Constantine Great set up before Rome even fell. So it's been thriving for a thousand years. Um, and now the Byzantine church or the 
Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, so the differences between these is they spoke different languages. Um, the East spoke Greek, uh, the West spoke Latin. Um, they had different cultures and believed in different religious icons. However, the uh, churches in the East still had to follow the Pope for guidance as they did through and after the fall of Rome. Still being controlled by the West, the Byzantine Church only grew hatred for the Western Roman Church. And finally, in 1054, Pope Leo IX struck at Michael Solares and his followers with an excommunication, and the Patriarch re retaliated with a similar excommunication. So this officially uh, broke the church into two, Eastern Orthodox Church and Western Roman Church. And there it is on our timeline. Um, lastly, the Western Schism from jumping to the 13th or 15th centuries. Um, major players were Pope um, Boniface the um, the seventh and King Philip the fourth of France. And then at this time there were multiple popes, and this this confused and definitely decreased papal power because multiple popes they obviously can't be that powerful. Um, bringing on uh, Pope Boniface the seventh and King Philip the fourth of France, uh, basically had a power circle. Uh, the French King uh, Philip the fourth taxed churches to finance his war against the English. Pope Boniface the seventh doesn't like this. Um, these two go back and forth trying to gain power over one another. They both do things to try to gain power over one another and try to assert dominance. Um, these two go back and forth uh, trying to gain power over one another until Philip the fourth sends men to capture and imprison him, leading to Pope bon Boniface the seventh's death. Uh, this power struggle eventually leads to two factions forming within the Western Church, a uh, pro-French versus an anti-French fraction. The pro-French fa factions uh, get Pope Clement IV elected, uh, but he stays in France um, as Rome was a stat wasn't Rome was in, in shambles at this time, so uh, Clement IV just stays in France. Um, along with Pope Clement IV, the papal court also moves to French moves to France with this period um, being referred to as the Avagon Papacy. Um, and then moving on, multiple popes. Um, after a few decades and then a few more popes uh, get elected and then die, the people of Rome rioted as a result of the Bishop of Rome not being in Rome for over 73 years. As well, the writing, uh, the Cardinals elect Urban the, the Sixth as Pope. You see on the map, they do this in Rome. And then, um, however, these same cardinals escaped to France where they elected a different pope, Pope Clement the, um, the Seventh. Um, this splits the church into the, uh, the France and then the Italian districts. Uh, eventually, a third pope is elected in 1409 by the Council of Pisa, as you can see, uh, Pope Alexander V. But finally, in 1414, the Council of Constance disposes of all three popes, ending the schism. But this forever decreases the, the power of the Pope, as if there are three of them, then it can't be that powerful. And then also it, it gains the idea that the real power in the church is being held by the advisors, not the Pope. If they can just elect three of them, then they really have the power, not the person being elected. But um, this is the our five major... Uh, major points happening in the history of the church during the Middle Ages. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you. And I hope you learned something.